A pleasant Sabbath to all of you. Good evening, everyone. This is the penultimate meeting that we have for this week of prayer. I just want to express my sincere thanks and gratitude for this wonderful experience that uh, this institution presented me with to be able to become an instrument of the Lord in this week of prayer. And I pray that as I have been blessed, I pray that all of us, all of you there, have also been blessed. You're probably wondering why I'm saying that I've been blessed. This is because many of the sermons, well, all of the sermons that the Lord led me into working on are sermons that spoke to me in many ways. I cannot tell you the impact of those. It seems a bit surprising, but there is a way in which you prepare a sermon, and before you know it, you realize that the sermon that you prepared was actually for you. Anyway, I want to thank the administration of this institution, especially the students, Dr. Ragui, for giving me this opportunity to lead you in your week of prayer. And I'm also especially happy because we have come to the Sabbath hours. The week has been a very, very hectic week. Not to say that I have been traveling back and forth to Manila. Uh, every night I was thinking that I'd be having some kind of a break by staying here in the beautiful guest house that was prepared for us. It only happened that there are so many things that I needed to attend to, just like this morning, that I cannot just uh, turn my back on those responsibilities. So even though I wanted to stay here and sleep and enjoy the lovely air, fresh air of Silang, I just had to go to Manila every night. But thank God, it's Sabbath. Thank God we have a rest. Thank God that we can worship him together and find comfort in his presence. Numbers, numbers fascinate me. I think that by now, you will have an idea of it, especially if you consider the titles. We have had for the meetings of this week of prayer. Tonight, tonight we come to another title oriented to numbers. I don't know what's wrong with this equipment I have. It's not working. <laughs> I'm just glad that... Uh, we gave, I gave the flashcard to our people there, but this equipment in front of me is not working. Anyway, tonight we come to another title oriented to numbers. One plus one plus one equals one. In simple arithmetic, this title is a real no-no. There is no way in the world that when you add three ones, you will come up with still one for an answer. There must be more beyond this title. And I'm telling you, there is more, really more, beyond this title. We shall shortly come to that. For now, let me draw your attention to some amazing symmetry that numbers present to us.
Anyway. Numbers. They say to us many things. And numbers are amazing. And if num numbers are amazing, the mind behind the numbers are even more amazing. In fact, the creator of numbers has a mind so amazing that we cannot fully fathom the depth and breadth of his thoughts. Consider the following. In this slide, you will sense the symmetry that only an infinite mind can create at a glance. And I believe that God is a mathematician par excellence. This assumption is not being funny nor stating the obvious. God is really a great mathematician. The whole idea is to get us to realize how puny our sinful mind is. A recognition of God being a God, an excellent God of mathematics is actually the right step towards giving God the glory and honor. I'd like to draw you to this one particular slide. It's like, it's a symmetry like no other. You get, after number one, what comes? Of course, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then after that, the zero as well. When you consider what follows, you put the number one times eight plus one, what's your product? What's, what's the answer? Nine, of course. If you add to that one a two and that one becomes 12, okay? If that one becomes 12, you multiply it by 8 and add 2, what do you have? 98. If you add 3 to 12, becomes 20, 123 by 8 plus 3, what is your answer? 987. And if you keep on adding until you get 2, the full one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What do you have? You have here a set of numbers that is actually an equation. Okay. When you look at this set of numbers, uh, We can only stare at it initially and try to figure out how the entire thing came out so beautifully, admire its perfect symmetry and long for more. I'll give you more. I'll give you more, okay? And here in these slides, you will see the beauty of God's mathematics. You'll see that there is a number eight, it's a constant number. I'll speak more about that later on. But let's go to another slide. Instead of eight, we use nine as the constant. And when you keep on adding to from one becomes 12, one, 23, one, two, three, four, up to one, two, three, four, five, up to nine, multiply that by nine, add 10, what do you have? A series of ones. Beautiful, huh? If you look at another slide here, 9 by 9 plus 7, 88, and then you go down, you have 888888. Eight, 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 eight. <laughs> Beautiful numbers. This mind boggling beauty and symmetry of numbers didn't just happen by chance. They tell us something about God. 
they tell us something that because we are not really I'm not a good math mathematician but I'm just awed by these numbers these numbers are actually telling us something about God only an infinite God can inspire these complex numbers and must be God's gift to mankind to point our hearts to him let's go back to our title how do you consider our title tonight one plus one plus one equals one what is this ones what are these ones one 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 equals one I think you have you might have guessed it by now of course we are looking at the Trinity three persons one God you know it took me a while it really took me a long long while to figure this out but it will be very very presumptuous for me to say that at this point in my let's say situation a student of the Bible if I will say that I have understood everything in relation to the Trinity I will be very very presumptuous and I might even be sinning against God because this doctrine of the Trinity is something that is so beautiful it didn't just come about there is a long history behind it there is a long theology behind the Trinity doctrine and still it's going on it's not just that you're looking at the long history and theology you're also looking at things that we need to understand more I don't know what happened see I have experienced this kind of thing many 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 times when the people of God are being led by the Lord and by the Spirit sometimes the devil tries to work out things to take away our attention from what we are studying and sometimes the Lord allows that so that we will see that we really need to depend on the Lord Christian thinking is divided as to the reality of the Trinity have you thought of that and yes aside from that uh, it's difficult to comprehend the Trinity simply by a mathematical formulation in fact our children here they will not agree with me because they know in their preschool classes and in their elementary classes that when you add one 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 three times it'll give you how many three how come we have one 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 three ones we add them all up and we come up to one the Trinity is incomprehensible simply by pure mathematical computation or mathematical formulation what we have brethren is some people resorting to this idea of faith they cannot comprehend it they cannot explain logically and so they say well let's just take it by faith is this something that the Lord wants us to do anything that we cannot explain anything that we cannot just understand let's just say we take it by faith that is a wrong use of faith because in many ways God can really be understood if only we will try with our puny minds we will try with our weak comprehension 
to see the way in which the Lord is leading us. The Trinity is one of the most beautiful Christian teachings we have. I think the best approach for us to do is to simply let the Lord through the Bible lead us because as we allow the Lord to lead us in our attempts to study this, I think God will help us understand what really it is all about. You know, I'm, I'm a bit uncomfortable bringing out this subject tonight. Hey, this is a seminary where theology is very much studied where things about God where things about God are as far as we can work it out dissected examined evaluated whatever but I think there is a sense in which a re-study of this doctrine of the Trinity will help us to see what God wants us to be, to do, and to be. Okay? So let's try to see what the Lord wants us to do by simply working on this doctrine from the biblical point of view. We cannot understand the Trinity Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We cannot understand the Trinity simply by trying to rely upon our human understanding because really brethren we cannot fully understand it there is no way for us to understand it we can only understand the idea or the truth about the Trinity I think, as the Lord wants us to understand it, in the light of humanity's need for salvation. I heard one of my professors say that God so loved the world that he divided himself. God so loved the world that he allowed himself to be divided because as a whole sinful man cannot comprehend the totality of God. I would say that sinful man cannot even comprehend the single person that Jesus is or the single person that the Spirit is or the single person that the Father is. But when we look at the Trinity in the light of our need for salvation, there comes to us light that will help us to see where God is leading us. So, what is it that humans need? We need salvation. God cannot come down to us in his bare nature, in his bare glorious nature because we know that God's glorious nature will kill us, snuff out our lives. So God had to come in into, human, into the human situation. He had to send his son Jesus Christ, so that in Jesus' humanity, we can understand 
we can listen to God talking to us in Jesus so we can through Jesus see the mighty acts the mighty things he did and that through Jesus we may more fully understand God's redemptive purpose when Jesus died on the cross it is not just that he died there because there is something that we need to do well we cannot die for our own selves I cannot die for you you cannot die for me because all of us are sinful and no sinful man can redeem his kind so Jesus has to come in in all of his righteousness covering his glorious nature his glorious divinity with humanity shed his blood on Calvary died for us um, what I'm saying is the father in his person as a father must be understood in terms of realities in terms of relationships the father cannot be a father without a son and it is only in biblical religion where you find God being viewed as a father and it is also in biblical religion alone where you find the son by his words by his acts by the way he thought which he also every now and then presented to his disciples this son is the son of God who revealed the father and in revealing the father we understand that the father was the one who sent and the son was the one who was sent but you see you cannot simply work on it along those lines because to focus purely on the functions and the roles of the persons of the Godhead to make too rigid an emphasis on the father being the one who sent his son and the son being the one who was the provision through which humanity came to understand salvation and then to look at the spirit as the one who was sent by Jesus so that the spirit will make known to people everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus did we cannot very very rigidly consider the Trinity by virtue of the roles and function because that is a dangerous path to follow because you will end up coming with three gods look at it this way the father would not be understandable apart from relationships in fact in the Old Testament it was necessary for God to be called a father first of all to his people Israel that's why in Hosea chapter 11 you find God calling out Israel out of Egypt 
Israel is considered by God as his son. Israel, Israel was trying to, well, in the Bible, the Bible is trying to give us an understanding that Israel is related to God by virtue of God having chosen Israel, not just as his people, but as his son to begin with, collectively speaking. And then, when you go to the book of Psalms, you find that the king of Israel was also called by God as his son. The idea of God being the father brings in the idea of relationships. The idea of Jesus being the son who gave his life for sinful humans is for us to understand that unless we relate to Jesus as Jesus relates to the Father, the idea there is for us to understand what God is trying to do to us and for us. So Jesus left. But before he left, he said, it is necessary that I live so that the Comforter can come. It is necessary that I live because if I do not live, the Helper will not come. The Spirit will not come. The Spirit gives us an understanding of the things that the people of God need to do and to know. Need to know and to do. The Spirit has to come in so that all of the people of the world will have the opportunity to relate to Jesus or to relate to the Father through Jesus and through the enlightenment that the Spirit gives to us individually. God wants us, by the way, to not just stay here as saved individuals. He wants us eventually to go into the kingdom, into the glories of the kingdom, but that is impossible to do in our fallen, sinful situation. And that is the reason why the Spirit was given so that while we are here on earth, by the power of the Spirit, through the guidance of His Spirit, we will come to a fuller and fuller and fuller understanding of the overall plan of God for us. That's why there is this basic revelation that's more fully understood in the light of God's, God's redemptive purpose that was manifested in Jesus. But it is not enough that we come to understand that we were saved by Jesus. We were not saved by Jesus for us to stay on this earth alone. And the Spirit is the one leading us so that as we stay on this earth and make the necessary preparations before Jesus comes, He will help us to grow in grace. He will help us to let that character of Christ become eventually manifested in our lives. And that way, we are slowly, little by little, changed into the image of our Creator. That's why here on earth we are being prepared. And I remember, again, Mrs. White, she was saying, when the character of Christ has been manifested in His people, then 
He will come to claim them as His own. We cannot enter into the glories of heaven with this sinful, mistake-prone, evil character. Even though we are saying that Jesus saved us, even though we are saying that Jesus is out there willing to help us out, there is a need for us to cooperate with God because God will not force us to enter into His kingdom against our will. And it is only when we decide every day, every moment of our lives to cooperate with God through the Spirit to change our lives. Only then can God work in us. For now, we cannot say that we know everything. In fact, we know very little. We are limited even by the language we use, by the words we use. We cannot say everything that has to be said in relation to the Trinity, in relation to the functions of each one of them. There is a sense in which we have to understand that the secret things belong to God. There is a sense in which we have to accept that we cannot know everything here on earth. But praise the Lord, hallelujah, because we know that when we get to that great beyond the science and song of redemption will be the theme of our study forever. What was given to us to understand would be enough, enough for now to bring us, for us to enter into the glories of that glorious kingdom. Numbers fascinate. But we cannot know everything. We, even Einstein in his great, great mind doesn't know every mathematical formula that is out there. There's more to be discovered, more to be known, more to be understood. And just like God, there are many things about God, many things about our salvation that we still do not know. But for now, we need to have a very, very close relationship with God the Father, with the Son. And that relationship can only be worked out by the continual working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. And then, as we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, then we will be made ready for the glorious appearing of Jesus, our Savior. Question, why is it that Jesus has not yet returned? It's a question that has been asked by many people. Theologians are not very much interested in answering that question, but it is a question that we all need to ask ourselves. Why is it that Jesus has not returned yet? Because the work has not been finished yet. Verse 14 of Matthew 24, we read there, Jesus is saying that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world as a witness unto all nations. And then the end will come. The preaching of the gospel is not done yet. There are still many people out there who does not know, who have, given, who have not been given the opportunity to know Jesus. And inside the church, the work of God is not finished yet. We say we are pastors, students of the word, 
it is not by virtue of your being a pastor that Jesus will save you. It is not by virtue of you being a director or even a president of the union or of an institution that Jesus will save you. You will be saved by virtue of the relationship that you have developed with God. Brethren, I cannot speak more about this because really words are not enough for us to come to an understanding of what truly the totality of the Trinity is. One thing I know, God in his love for us had assumed personalities by which we are able to understand even a little bit about him. He became our father so that we will know our need for a father. God also became a son so that we will know how to be obedient to the father. And he became the spirit so that we may be able to cooperate with God in working out our salvation. As I said, we cannot too rigidly work or focus on the functions and roles because there is a danger attending to such rigidness. One thing I know, once I was a sinner. Jesus came in obedience to the Father died on the cross for me and now through the spirit working in my heart and through the spirit working in the hearts of everyone in this hall we are given the opportunity to make ourselves ready for the coming of Jesus the kingdom beckons the Lord is asking you not that you are a pastor not that you are an officer not that you are a president. The Lord is asking you whether in your understanding of who God is, He is asking whether you have developed that relationship that is so necessary for you to be accepted by God as His son or as His daughter. God loves us. Love is a relational word. You cannot comprehend love if you do not relate to somebody who loves you or who you love. You cannot comprehend the love of God, actually. Impossible for us to comprehend the totality of God's love. Somebody was asked the question, how big, how great is the love of God? Came back the answer, if you're able to count all the leaves of the forest, if you're able to count all the stars at night, if you're able to count all the sand by the seashore, brother, you are simply beginning to understand the love of God. It's so great. It's so big. The only way for us to understand God and this love is to look at Him as our Father. Believe in his son so that by believing we can learn also the virtue of obedience and accept the workings of the Holy Spirit in our hearts so that by cooperating with God, we are making ourselves ready for the glorious, marvelous appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One plus one plus one, one God three persons, one heaven to win, one life to live. I want my life to be lived for God, not only on this earth, but in that glorious kingdom 
waiting for me. The theme that we have accepted for this union, for the entire division and for the entire world, revival, reformation. But in this union, we are talking not just of revival, reformation, we're also talking of the beyond. So our total theme is revival, reformation, and beyond. We can talk of revival. We can talk of reformation. But unless we go beyond all talks about revival and reformation are simply that, talks. But if we want to really go beyond, if we want to enter into the gloriousness of that kingdom, we need to have a real, real heart revival. We need to have a real reformation, something that can only be done as the Trinity works in us. When the work outside has been finished and the work inside is also done, then I believe Jesus will come. But don't say, well, I'll just bide my time then. No. There is a point in time when God will say, enough is enough. I am coming. Ready or not, I am coming back. I pray that when that time comes, we will truly be made ready and we will really enter into the glories of that kingdom. The kingdom of God beckons. The kingdom of God calls for you to make a total surrender so that we will be made ready for the soon coming of our Savior. Let us pray, Heavenly Father. In our finite understanding of things, please forgive us but please help us to know that there are things that we can learn. There are things that we can understand. Things that by our understanding will help us to move closer into relating to you as a father. Into relating with Jesus as your son. So that by looking at Jesus we will know how to become obedient. And that by cooperating and considering seriously how your spirit works in us, we can cooperate with you in making us ready inside in our hearts, in our minds, so that we can be made ready for the soon coming of our Savior. Father, let us experience truly getting ready. Let us experience truly getting into the glories of your kingdom. Not one of us not one child, not one son, one daughter, not one parent, not one father, not one mother will be missed. But all of us together in Jesus, all of us, Father, may we obtain and may we have the great privilege of entering into that glorious kingdom you have been preparing for all of us. This, O oh Father, is our prayer and we're asking this in the lovely, worthy, beautiful name of our Savior Jesus Christ who sent His Spirit to work in us. Amen.